Okay, thank you everybody. And now for something totally different, as Monty Python would say. I'm going to tell you a story about the Gulf of Mexico. It's not just the usual disaster story in the wake of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill that you are more or less familiar with, but I hope a more multidimensional tale of why the Gulf of Mexico is important and interesting and deserves to be valued and protected. So, dirty blizzard in the deep Gulf of Mexico. It can be this beautiful. Wide open expanse of ocean. It belies the bad image of the Gulf. It is normally the most neglected American ocean. Everybody is talking about the West Coast and the East Coast. You have certain mental images and ideas, usually positive ones, connected to these coasts. But when talks comes to the Gulf of Mexico, it's sort of the slightly disreputable underbelly of the United States where we have a lot of mud and oil spills, etc., etc. This is not necessarily so. I have been working in the Gulf of Mexico now for quite some time and would like to show you something about this deep water ecosystem. First, the usual media images. Of course, everybody hopefully remembers the uh, deep water horizon disaster which cost the lives of 11 oil drill platform workers, um, injected a huge amount of gas and oil into the northern Gulf of Mexico. Here you see some of the um, floating um, oil layers um, observed in early May 2010, and the microbial goo that grew shortly afterwards, and after a while all that stuff was sinking into the deep sea. When you see it in sediment samples, these little cores, these funny brownish things on top, um, as you see here in the bottom left corner, and of course a lot washed up on our beaches. So, what else? Why should we really look at the Gulf of Mexico in a different perspective? I will show you that it is the most amazing deep underwater ecosystem worthy of protection and appreciation, something that everybody can connect to and care about. And of course, nothing beats but seeing with your own eyes. And of course, here I'm in a privileged position as I actually could go down into the Gulf on this research ship, the Atlantis, with a crew of scientists and a research submersible, the Alvin, which takes us deep down into the Gulf, all the way 1,500 meters deep, to the very bottom of the Gulf of Mexico, the neighborhood of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill where the whole disaster unfolded, and it will allow us to take a look at this deepwater ecosystem directly. Okay, here we have Alvin, sort of surfing. It is a beautiful submersible, neat, practical, tidy. It has room for exactly one pilot and two observers. And the space is much worse than any economy class I have ever sat in. And of course, there is no bathroom. Dives take eight hours, so you have to dehydrate yourself before every dive to avoid embarrassing situations. <laughs> um, and of course, uh, I should just add, there's a special factor. When Alvin is lowered into the water and dancing on the waves, it's a feeling like you are sitting on the inside of a laundry machine. And there's no off. You have to wait until the sub is fished out of the water by the mothership, and then you can brief a sigh of relief. But what you see on these dives, bottles in mind, the deep water Gulf of Mexico is, of course, not one of these places that you know, let's say, from Ge National Geographic type movies about coral reefs or beautiful coral fish or sharks or whatever. It has specialties on its own. It has many deep water um, ecosystems which depend for their sustenance on gradual seepage of natural oil springs and gas springs right at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. Unique. And these particular habitats sustain special animal communities like these thick muscle beds or tube worms, which sit in huge masses on the seafloor. If you know marine biology a little bit, 
when you look at the deep sea floor, you do not expect much. There's a little bit from time to time. Maybe a little star, a starfish, a clam, and just mud in between. Not here so. In these oases of deep life at the bottom of the Gulf, you have unbelievable teeming oases of life fueled by natural seepage of hydrocarbons. The same stuff that erupted so uncontrollably and with such brutal force in the deep water horizon explosion. By gradual seepage, just a little bit at a time, it sustains life forms which take advantage of these hydrocarbon components, normally not by eating it directly, but by keeping little bacterial surveillance busy, which live in their own bodies, take up gases, like methane and sulfide, which are common in these um, deep hydrocarbon seeps. The bacteria grow inside the bodies of a host, and the host takes up a few of these from time to time and makes a living quite happily. It seems to be a very sustainable way of life. These two bombs here, sitting in the Gulf of Mexico, helping their bacterial symbionts to do whatever they are doing, oxidizing seed gases, can reach an age of several hundred years. When you look closer, you see not just these rose bush like tube bombs, you see right on the seafloor muscle beds, all of them in one way or another dependent on symbiotic bacteria, which take up hydrocarbon components, petroleum components, slowly metabolize them, and help their host animals to make a living. Some of these invertebrates are meanwhile so dependent on their symbiotes that they have more or less forgotten to make their own digestive tract. These two forms and many of the muscles, well not all of them, do not have a digestive tract on their own, they just live on their symbiotes. Here we have a little crab, snails, riding and crawling up and down on these two bombs. It is a strangely beautiful place, full of little creatures which make their own living, unobserved by the multitudes. Still, one can say, do they not deserve their own right of existence? They should be left in peace to their own mode of life which is often staggeringly unique and completely unexpected and out of the ordinary. Here we have again something totally different. We have in the deep sea sponge gardens in locations where deep sea pitch generates thick bacterial clouds in the water and these sponges are filtering the bacteria out, making living less in this way. Many of these sponges are made of the same material as glass, silica. They can be compared to delicate glass artworks of nature, and they are at least as fragile. From time to time, when you are looking out of the porthole of the submersible, something completely unexpected is swimming by, like this little octopus. It has a very weird form. The hind part of the body seems to be cracked upwards. It doesn't seem to be discomforted by this. It swam around the algae, looked, peeped into the portholes, did a little dance, a little waltz, said, hello, do you know who I am? Do you know my name? Sorry, I am unknown to silence. It whoosh, gone he was. <laughs> and this just 200 nautical miles south of New Orleans. So, within the least loved American Ocean, you have life forms that, in many cases, have not even been seen before. Science knows nothing about them. Due to the difficulty of observing them in their own habitat, we just don't get there very often. And last but not least, since I'm a microbiologist, I could not resist putting in this little slide, wherever you have slow hydrocarbon seepage from the seafloor, a mix of interesting gases like sulfide, and methane, and hydrogen, and CO2, everything stirred together to an interesting cocktail. You can have mats of filamentous bacteria, which are now so large, you do not need a microscope. You can pick these apart with a toothpick. You can look at them with an unaided eye, like little worms. You would be fooled. You think, hmm, what is this? If they could talk, they would say, we are bacteria, but they don't admit it. Put us down again. All this 
was wiped out in the immediate neighborhood of the Macondo Valley. This is an image of the seafloor at 1500 meters depth, very close to the valley, as close as regulations would permit. Alvin cannot just go anywhere, there's a certain exclusion zone around the wellhead because of all the debris, um, the ruins of the drilling site which are now scattered over the seafloor. So this is as close as we could get. Uh, all the seafloor life is now smothered by a layer of oil derived fallout. The stuff that has been floating on the sea surface in May 2010 and then over summer and fall was slowly depositing and hitting all the marine life that had the bad fortune of being sessile, not being able to run away, and they were smothered. The little insert shows a sediment sample where we had to see just dead worms, dead worms, dead worms, not a single one alive. A little bit higher up, this is only 900 meters deep, where much of the underwater oil cloud had already dissipated. The effects of the oil spill were a little bit less burst, but still noticeable. You see a deep water coral, a gorgonian. These filter-feeding organisms take 500 years to grow to full size. So they are the equivalent of deep sea oak trees. And since they are filter-feeding, they were filtering oil-derived debris out of the water column and poisoned themselves. So many of these are gone. If you just look at these gorgonians, you can put a timeline on the recovery of the gulf. 500 years. This is the time that it will take to replace the slow-growing deep-sea life forms. Below you see these uh, strangely brownish crabs. Actually, they should be purple, bright purple, reddish. Here they are sort of blotched. They have these strange brownish colors and their behavior is altered. A deep-sea crab worth its salt will attack the submersible. When Alvin moves in zoom, towards a crab, the crab will raise itself on its hind leg and put the scissors out, completely confident, attacking the gigantic spaceship. These are just <laughs> sitting there, sort of lethargic, and do not care about anything. So the oil has done something to them, and it was certainly not good. So I'm only half joking, and I think one of the responses, or one of the lessons, from this disaster should be the establishment of marine sanctuaries, the equivalent of underwater national parks in the Gulf of Mexico. In many places it is already being done. You will remember the establishment of the Western Hawaii Island um, marine sanctuary in the last months of the Bush administration, if you are very old like me. And <laughs> something like this would make sense. In the Gulf of Mexico, we, know, we have now a fairly good idea of the extent of the damage of the deep water horizon. Of course, like temples, some damage has extended everywhere. The most heavily damaged deep sea area is relatively constrained, uh, maybe a couple of dozen miles around the wellhead, and a big lobe extending southwesterly, consistent with the deep sea current. So even a big explosion, like this one, which hopefully won't repeat itself so soon, does not kill the entire gulf, but does damage only a part of it. But if we can manage to set some of these deep sea ecosystems aside, on purpose, but deliberately, and say, okay, here we let these animals in peace, we do not disturb them, we stay away from deep drilling, it would make a big difference. Right now, of all the mineral lease blocks in the Gulf of Mexico, Northern Slope, which are big chunks of territory parceled out with names like Mississippi Canyon, and then comes another one, one, two, three, four, five, up to 400 whatsoever. Of all these lease blocks, a single one, Mississippi Canyon 118, a square mile, is set aside for research. Not even explicitly for protection. One can do better in the deep Gulf of Mexico. Last but not least, I would like to thank, of course, my co-conspirators who have made all this possible. Science is not the endeavor of a crazy individual. Nowadays, it is a group effort. You need a bunch of trusted colleagues from all over the world. The names will tell you. Brazil, China, Germany, USA, Denmark. And, of course, you need the Alvin team, intrepid, 
magician, electrical engineers, underwater adventurers to keep the whole show going. And if you're interested in what I was able to say today, also look at this website, ecogeek.org. It gives you an overview on current ecosystem monitoring in the Gulf of Mexico, the state of affairs, what scientists of all flavors, not just biologists, but chemists, physical oceanographers, marine mammal experts, are doing in order to evaluate the long-term effect of the oil spill on the Gulf of Mexico to mitigate its consequences and to help making sure that such a disaster can never happen again. Thank you very much.